60 years ago, Singapore sowed the seeds for a garden city. Over the years, it blossomed into a symbol of the nation's values and aspirations. When they come into the airport, especially investors, they will pass by greenery, which means maintenance. So without having to tell anything to the CEO, I knew that he would understand that when I say we will deliver, he knows that we can deliver. Today, the greening journey continues as Singaporeans chart the course in brave new ways. Some battle invasive species. There is no point trying to grow a million trees when the saplings are attacked. Others conserve natural treasures. I wonder why our palms don't grow that tall. And these horticulturists search for new plants in Latin America, just as their predecessors did at the dawn of the Garden City movement. We are carrying the proud tradition of trying to push the boundaries and see what else we can bring back to Singapore. Singapore's Gardens by the Bay is home to a diverse collection of plants. 1.5 million of them, curated from almost every continent in the world. It's also a sanctuary for thousands of mature trees, saved and transplanted here when their former sites were redeveloped. Some have unusual features and are subjects of study in a vast natural classroom. And this flower is very unusual. Do you notice? Fruits and flowers grow from a trunk, but in normal plants, flowers grow from branches. Every tree is unique, even amongst its species. Clarice Shear's job is to discover the needs of each individual tree. She's an arborist, a tree doctor, one of over 600 in the country. Trees can't talk, so I connect with them, not only through their physical form, but by instinct. Like a doctor, I take care of the trees and their well-being in the gardens. To nurture the trees and see them grow well makes my career deeply rewarding. I'm going up to check the canopy for an area inspection. I'm looking out for branches, uh, dead branches, and then branches with conditions of concern. So sometimes uh, at the ground level, you may not be able to see all this condition of concern. That's why uh, for taller trees, we may uh, climb to inspect them. Soon, Clarice will scale even higher heights in her career. She's been handed a special assignment. So, CEO, this is our proposed plant exploration trip to Latin America. In this part, they actually have a diverse range of native and non-native trees, which include... In a month's time, Clarice will be leading a team of horticulturists from Gardens by the Bay on an expedition to Latin America. The trip is inspired by similar visits to the region made by the country's pioneer generation of horticulturists. In the 1960s, Singapore scaled up the planting of trees. These included plants like rain trees that were brought in from Latin America by the former British colonial government. Singapore's greening pioneers were looking for more trees that could provide shade and cool down temperatures. This led them back to Latin America, which had a vast collection of tropical plants that could possibly adapt to local climates. Over time, these Latin American plants became naturalized, and generations of Singaporeans have grown to love them. 
Six decades on, a new generation of horticulturists will trace the footsteps of their predecessors. They will be hitting Costa Rica, Ecuador, Brazil, and Argentina. So CEO, may I have your permission to proceed with this? Uh, I myself am looking forward to it. Uh, I, I wrote to the good minister and he has commented that this will be a very meaningful way to honour our founding generations uh, who travel miles who go to these places. So uh, let's proceed. While the expedition may be rooted in the past, it's also about looking ahead. Clarice has been assigned to source new trees from Latin America. She'll be bringing them back for future generations of Singaporeans to enjoy. Landscaping with plants is like doing a painting. It's not only about planting one tree on its own, but using a variety of trees and plants which complement each other. To realise this painting, Clarice and her team will be searching Latin America for plants that have interesting features, can support biodiversity, and are resistant to the effects of climate change. These include tougher versions of trees from Singapore's past that were affected by threats like disease, as well as other plants that would evoke a sense of nostalgia among Singaporeans. The new trees from Latin America will be planted here at Bay East Garden. Situated opposite the main gardens, it was originally developed as a venue for water sports events. By 2027, it will be reimagined as a new garden. It will have at its center the Founders Memorial. The memorial will be surrounded by lush greenery, specially curated to pay homage to Singapore's greening story. A story which began 60 years ago in 1963 when Lee Kuan Yew planted the Mampat, a native tree at Ferrer Circus. This marked the launch of a nationwide planting campaign. When the independent Singapore government was formed, what you had was a forested, for the most part, rural area, but the urban landscape was quite barren. There was a lot of concrete. And so there was a desire to introduce trees and plants for a number of reasons. One, it makes it more livable environment. It is also based on policies and ideas developed in England in the 1930s and, and 40s called the Garden City, in which if you put people within green spaces, they will have better mental attitudes toward the larger society, they will be more productive, and so it's to create a more livable urban landscape. Over the past 60 years, the number of trees has grown to more than 7 million. Today, a grove of mumpat trees stand proudly over Ferrer Circus. Brian Yeo, an arborist with the National Parks Board, traces the roots of Singapore's greening movement back to this historic spot. Our founding Prime Minister, Mr Lee Kuan Yew, planted the mumpat tree at this Ferrer Circles to kickstart the nationwide greening campaign to soften the harshness of urbanisation. When I visited the spot, I felt proud and inspired as uh, we have gone through 60 years of greening and it's very educational for the younger generation to learn how we get to where we are. Brian is helping to plot the next chapter of Singapore's greening story. From a garden city, the country is transforming into a city in nature with different natural habitats across the island connected to form a vast ecological corridor. Brian and his colleagues are helping realize this through the way they curate and maintain Singapore's streetscapes. This includes injecting a dash of color to lift spirits. Flowering trees are my favorite. In fact, seeing colorful trees in my daily work is just perfect. It adds vibrancy to my work and it's even more fulfilling when residents come up to us and, and show appreciation, compliment on our efforts in greening up the, the streetscape with colourful trees and shrubs. 
The country's 60-year-old greening story is evolving, and government gardeners aren't the only characters. Residents, too, are playing their part in safeguarding the country's rich natural heritage. Gardening enthusiast Irene Nu believes conservation begins with first learning to identify and appreciate the flora and fauna around their neighborhoods. It was by accident that she became guardian to a priceless natural treasure. Unbeknown to us when we planted it more than 33 years ago, we didn't know it was a tembusu. I had a sapling that's about this, this, this height, yeah. So when a plant in that spot died of a fertilizer overdose, we used this sapling as a replacement plant. When we entered our garden for the first time in a gardening contest organized by the National Park Sport, one of them spotted and said, wow, you have a tembusu tree. Tembusu tree is a heritage tree. And another one said, do you know it's a protected tree? And even if it's growing in your own property, you are not allowed to chop it down. If we ever have to move out of this house, I hope the new owner will continue to care and protect it. Knowing that this is a heritage tree, it behoves us to take care of it. Our tembusu tree has uh, put deep roots, you know, in, in our garden, spanning over 30 years, and it has a very special place here. As it turns out, Irene's tembusu is two meters short of the five meter trunk circumference to qualify as a heritage tree. The tree must also have some cultural or historical value. Anyone can submit a nomination for a heritage tree. The scheme was introduced in 2001 to inculcate a sense of stewardship in protecting Singapore's mature trees. This other tembusu at the Singapore Botanic Gardens is almost 200 years old and one of the most famous heritage trees in the city. Clarissa's passion for conservation stems from a deep-rooted connection with another iconic tree. The Tababuya rosea, a common roadside tree in Singapore. Its resemblance to Japan's famous flowering tree has earned it the nickname Singapore Sakura. When I was young, I had a beautiful Tababuya rosea just outside my balcony. When it bloomed, the canopy of the tree against the sky was like a piece of art, which was an inspiration and beauty to me. When the flowers fell onto the grass, it covered the whole carpet of grass with pink. Many years later, the area which I was staying at was affected by development, and I was very sad because the tree was eventually removed. That ignited my passion for greenery. Clarissa's passion will inspire her in Latin America. There, she'll examine the Tababuya rosea and other trees Singapore had sourced from the region in their natural habitats. Nestled in the center of Central America lies one of the most biodiverse countries in the world. Costa Rica is home to about half a million species of flora and fauna, more than 5% of the world's biodiversity. The gardens by the Bay Team have arrived at Wilson Botanical Gardens, the first pit stop in that Latin American expedition. So here you see the garden sun on that side. Yeah, yeah. So that the water is retained there. Ah. Clarice and her colleagues were led here by historical documents in the Singapore Botanic Gardens. According to these documents, Singapore's National Garden had a seed exchange with Wilson in the 1980s. We 
Oh. Oh. These are the records. You can recognize their name here, Singapore Botanical Garden, and these are the species that were donated from. Well, among all these, you have uh, different countries, but here we yeah. found a record of Singapore. Singapore. The records from the Wilson Botanical Garden's archives confirm the exchanges did indeed happen on 28th April 1981. It also shows the type of plants that Singapore contributed. Most are palm species, native to Southeast Asia. We hear many stories by our previous colleagues. They actually went to a lot of places to collect seeds. Some of them become our roadside trees. For us to actually hear about these stories and coming to a place with a younger group of officers, when they open the book, the plant are registered, when they actually see the word Singapore, a group of Singaporeans actually travel afar to come to a place like this, make me feel very humble. Yes, yes, yes. You it's a very educational for the officers mm -hmm. to see firsthand the specimen. Thank you so much. In the early stages of Singapore's greening journey, horticulturists ventured to remote places. They overcame tough terrain and differences in language and culture. In navigating this strange environment while seeking out new plants, they demonstrated courage and resolve. It's in this same spirit of exploration that Clarice and her team are visiting Costa Rica today. So this was one of the palm sweets Singapore gave to this botanic garden. That's right. That's right. Oh yeah. wow! Yeah, Something different is like there's a lot of uh, lichens and mosses which are going on the stem. Uh, I don't yeah. see this in Singapore. Mm -hmm. The palms from Singapore have thrived despite the much higher altitude here. Yeah. One in particular, the lipstick palm, evokes memories of home. Wow. This is an iconic palm in Singapore too. Seeing the palms all the way in the other part of the world, in Costa Rica, thriving well, evoked a sense of pride. The history and, and conservation issues behind that? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, right now it's not good. Um, Thank you so much. Um, thanks for coming here and signing me. With this visit, the Gardens by the Bay team plants the seeds for future collaborations and exchanges between two botanical institutions from opposite corners of the world. Over the past 60 years, such partnerships have brought numerous benefits to Singapore's greening scene. One institution that has been at the forefront of these exchanges is the Singapore Botanic Gardens. It's one of only three botanic gardens in the world to have been conferred World Heritage status. Here in the botanic gardens, we have plant exchanges with botanic gardens all over the world. It involves training and where there's uh, capacity building and where knowledge can be shared in terms of how plants are grown. Another aspect that we have is staff exchanges and it's not just staff from Singapore Botanic Gardens going overseas for capacity building. It's also about having other overseas staff from their Botanic Gardens coming in to learn how we do things. In an era where the world's biodiversity is constantly threatened by climate change, plant exchanges between Botanic Gardens around the world have become even more relevant. The aim is to increase the survivability of different species by helping spread their biological footprint across different parts of the world. We are able to, in that way, conserve and have all the eggs spread out across different baskets around the world. I think in this era of climate change, it is especially important to continue with plant exchanges between botanic gardens where we're able to accumulate a large uh, stockpile of these rare and endangered plants from different countries that they can then be introduced back into the wild, especially when they are getting more depleted. Gardens by the Bay shares this vision. They believe that conservation stems from conversation. One venue where these conversations typically take place is inside the garden's cloud forest. 
This temperature control conservatory features an artificial waterfall mountain decked with some of the world's most exotic plant species. Here, visitors learn not only where these plants come from, but also the threats that confront these real-life ecosystems. In the actual cloud forest, temperature may vary, depends on the weather condition. Right? So when the temperature goes too high, the water vapour evaporates. So do you think the plants in the cloud forest can survive well? No. Meanwhile, in Costa Rica, Clarice and her colleagues are visiting a real cloud forest in the mountains. They are seeking to gain insights, which they can apply back at Gardens by the Bay. Biologist Dr. Evelyn Lynette leads the conservation efforts here. This is a very unusual fern. Very good for managing water when it's too little. It collects droplets. Tropical cloud forest is a vast living classroom with a wealth of lessons to be learned here. It soaks up carbon. So it's all here, we cut it. Our ability to fight climate change is lessened by a big chunk between the biodiversity, the carbon, and all the unknown richness here, biological richness, it, it's worth saving. These unique species thrive well in cool temperatures and places with high humidity. Conditions that horticulturist Li Xiaoyi has sought to create in Singapore's cloud forest dome. Seeing how the artificial habitat she and her team have created back home closely mirrors the real deal, assures her that they are on the right track. Recently, we have discovered some of the plants which we didn't plant growing inside the Cup Forest Conservatory. And mainly it's because of the high humidity and also of the waterfall. It is very encouraging for us to know that we have provided the right condition for the plants to thrive. Being here for the first time, my feeling is so surreal because I usually have seen cloud forests only in pictures or on books. I'm inspired to plant more plant collections to mirror the natural habitat of the real cloud forest. After two days in the mountains, the Gardens by the Bay team hit the suburbs. They visit La Sabana Metropolitan Park in San Jose, the nation's capital. After housing an airport for about 40 years, the land was redeveloped. Today, it's known as the Green Lungs of San Jose. It's the perfect place for Clarice to examine up close native trees she has shortlisted for Bay East Garden. One of which is the Terminalia oblonga, which is known as the Sua here. This tree has a peeling bark which gives it an interesting texture. It also has an emergent crown because it can go up to 35 meters, which provides a good resting spot for the birds and wildlife. Clarice and her team are following the footsteps of their pioneers and forging new frontiers in Singapore's greening journey. Will they have the same grit and gumption that brought their predecessors here in the past? This rubber tree has weathered many storms. It's the last vestige of a rubber plantation that was cleared in the 1940s. Today, 73-year-old Mohammed Amin, who used to stay in a village here, is visiting with his granddaughters. He tells them how the former plantation served as his childhood playground. You mean your great great man they plant until today? So when went 30 and today, almost 90 years, going to be 100 years already. I want to play around here, run here and there, collect the, you know, the rubber sheet, the ones, and play each other with the rubber sheet. We rub on the ground, 
it become hot and then touch on the people's body. That's how we spend our time at that time. Now. Today, the century-old rubber tree stands in front of a mosque. Amin tells his grandkids that a series of failed attempts to bring down the tree called for spiritual intervention. They call all the mediums and then come and pray. Find out actually we cannot, why we cannot cut the tree. Then from there we know they said they got Datu here. So the Datu want us to leave one tree for them because they are all three people in shop. But one man's sacred tree could easily be another man's weed. Rubber is notoriously known as an invasive species. Such plants spread aggressively and have the potential to harm natural habitats as well as the native flora and fauna living in them. In the early 1900s, when Singapore was under British colonial rule, rubber was widely planted across the island as a cash crop. Henry Ridley, who was then the director of the Botanic Gardens, led this planting campaign. This helped transform the region into a hub for latex production. Now, what this meant was you had a plant that was important for the Industrial Revolution, for the industrial economy, and this made it extremely valuable. And so when he domesticated this plant, it's a continuation of the same policy of plantations, which is simplification of the landscape. You only grow, theoretically, one species on a plot of land, instead of having thousands of different species leading to increased biodiversity and health of the biome. Today, rubber is no longer a threat, but the war against invasives is still far from over. Over the past few years, retired diplomat Joseph Coe has been leading a campaign against Dioscoria sansibarensis, more commonly known as Zanzibar yam or the Batman plant. In recent years, it has been growing aggressively in Singapore's nature parks. We need to remove those on the surface because if you don't remove them, you see they will spread like this. You can see this spreading. Dioscoria kills native plants by strangling them or depriving them of sunlight and nutrients. Weeding them out is no walk in the park. But Joseph is supported by a team of volunteers from N Park's Friends of the Park program. It's a ground-led initiative which promotes stewardship and responsible use of Singapore's parks. Their activities range from removing invasive species to planting trees. This to help Singapore meet its target of planting one million trees by 2030. What we are trying to do is to make sure that our forest is protected the ecological integrity of our forest is enhanced so that local biodiversity can be preserved. There is no point trying to grow a million trees when the saplings are attacked by the dust Korea. We need to conserve our biodiversity so it is the habitat that supports the entire spectrum of wildlife, you know, from small insects to spiders to larger mammals to birds and so on. And the integrity of the forest is not re preserved. All this will be threatened. Over in Ecuador, the Gardens by the Bay team discovers firsthand how efforts by locals to conserve native trees and restore natural habitats have borne fruit. When we look at trees, right, we are actually not looking at the tree itself, but the microclimate which comes with it. The flowers are really nice. When we saw the trees in Ecuador, we actually saw hummingbirds here, the stingless bees pollinating the flowers on the tree. When the plants do well, wildlife, like the birds, the bees, all comes together with it. Um, they help to pollinate and that process actually helps the trees and plants to reproduce, which is actually part of what shows a well-maintained garden. 
author Reese and her colleagues are visiting Equigenera, a local family business that has been supplying orchids and houseplants to Singapore for years. Owner Jose Pepe Portilla shows the team Equigenera's best kept secret, a secondary forest about two kilometers from his nursery, which he has been conserving for the past three years. Here, Pepe harvests seeds from native trees growing in the wild, which he then grows in his nursery. So this attracts another. The hummingbirds. Hummingbirds are very happy with this. Also on the trunk, like ours. Yeah. During the tour, Clarice discovers several species that are distantly related to trees in Singapore. This tree is actually like our cannonball tree. she has decided to bring back a tougher and future-proof version of a popular tree that has been threatened back home. Many Singaporeans have connection with angsanas, uh, including myself. Sad to say, it's actually affected by this disease called Pucera wilt. So bringing back this new species to Singapore, we hope that you will be more resilient to the disease. We hope that you will be more adaptable to the climate change, such as rising sea levels. From the serene countryside, the team heads to the bustling city of Guayaquil. Here, they visit Malacom 2000, a waterfront park flanked by the city centre. It offers some inspiration for the Gardens by the Bay team as they plan for their new extension. I've seen how people come to enjoy the space. Like an urban oasis in downtown, the parallel I can draw from the Malecon to Bay East Garden is how they are both waterfront gardens away from the maddening crowd. And in terms of the Bay East Garden, we intend to have water bodies across the garden that is not just purely aesthetic, but something that we can enjoy and interact with. Clarice will be returning to Gardens by the Bay with more than just inspiration. She'll be bringing back some of the tree species found in Malacca. In sourcing for trees for our gardens, we are looking out for trees which provide shade or have unique features. Here is a Seba tragosandia, which is actually similar to the couple of trees in Singapore. These trees have very pronounced buttresses and a beautiful green trunk. It reminds me of the incredible hawk in the Marvel series. But before bringing this superhero-looking tree back to Singapore, the team needs to ensure it doesn't end up becoming the villain of the country's greening story. A lot of the trees and shrubs that we bring in follow a strict quarantine uh, regime where uh, they are left in, in a quarantine area for at least two weeks to ensure that unwanted pests and disease are, are dealt with, uh, fumigated, uh, before they are actually planted on the ground. For some of the countries, we need to wash the roots. Okay. Only some of the countries? Uh, like US. A trip to Equigenera's packing facility inspires confidence. The condition they are subjected to, like the washing of the roots, checking them for pests and diseases are part of the stringent process, which was very assuring to see, where they actually clean the plants and check for their health before shipping the plants to Singapore. It gives us the assurance uh, that the plants are in good health condition before we receive them in Singapore. So that was actually a good learning process for us. The team will be bringing over 20 species of trees back from Ecuador. Time will tell if they will thrive in Singapore. But the team's drive to push boundaries and test out new plants reflects the same gumption displayed by their predecessors.
it's all work and no play for Singapore's Gardens by the Bay team as their expedition across Latin America takes them to Brazil. They are visiting the Rio de Janeiro Botanical Gardens. The gardens were set up in 1808 by King John VI of Portugal. His court ruled in exile here when his homeland was conquered by Napoleon. Today, traces of its royal heritage still remain. Clarice and her colleagues receive a regal welcome from Rio's unofficial Guard of Honor. A contingent of 134 imperial palm trees at the heart of the gardens. I wonder why our palms don't grow that tall. Yeah, that's interesting. Maybe they're not that old. Mm, probably. You planted them in the 18th century? 1800s. In, I was probably 1970s. Hmm, or 80s. Old, that's much younger. Yeah, so we still have 100 years to go. Yeah. <laughs> the imperial palm is just one of many plants that Singapore imported from Brazil over the decades. Clarice and her team get to examine them up close in Rio's botanical gardens. Seeing these trees uh, in their natural environment provides me valuable insights on how we can actually care uh, for them better in Singapore. The tour offers Clarice an encounter with her favourite tree, the Tababuya rosea. It's native to the region. But this tree is not in the best of shape. It's under attack by an unseen enemy. These cute little ants, uh, the leaf cutter ants, which are not so cute in reality. They are actually a known pest in this region because by removing all these leaves, the trees will not be able to photosynthesize. Lucky we don't have them in Singapore. Locals here regard the ants as part of the rich biodiversity in these once exclusive gardens, which were opened to the public in 1822. At the time, the people rejoiced at this gift of having a public garden which everyone could enjoy. And it's something Brazilians continue to cherish today. This innate love for green spaces is something that many Singaporeans can relate to. It's a topic that historian Sean Sia has long been fascinated with. Today, he's on a quest to locate the home of his ancestor, Sia Liang Sia, a well-known merchant and philanthropist. In the 1880s, Sia bought over a villa that once belonged to community leader Hu Ah Ke, more commonly known as Wampo. Originally named Wampo House, it was rechristened as Bandemir House by Xia. The villa had a beautiful Chinese garden. There were ponds, rockeries and shrubs that were maintained by Chinese gardeners from Guangdong. Wampo opened his garden to the public annually during Chinese New Year. Uh, so as he was a charitable and kind person, he wanted the garden to be available to the community. Xia Liang Xia continued this tradition of opening the garden to the public till his death in 1925. Today, a public housing estate stands over where Bendemir House used to be. But Xia Liang Xia and Hu Ah Ke's legacies live on. Singaporeans today have access to green spaces across the country. Over the past 60 years, the number of parks has grown to about 400. By 2030, every household will be within walking distance to a park. In the past, private gardens were luxuries for the rich and the wealthy, but today they are common green spaces for everyone to enjoy. So they are like community spaces. Bendimir House has now been demolished and redeveloped. However, if Xia Liang Xia and Wampo were alive today, I think they would be quite happy to know that we have reached this equilibrium between uh, urbanization and having our green spaces. After two weeks of traveling, Clarice and company are now in the final leg of their journey. The Argentinian capital of Buenos Aires is known for its well-designed parks and boulevards flanked by majestic trees. Some of them were introduced to Singapore before, like this pink lapacho. 
but here they try to intermix species. It was planted in Singapore in the past, but is now considered rare. The team is seeking to reintroduce this species, known for its tough, weather-resistant wood, to Bay East Garden. Among the list of registers that we saw where exchanges uh, were found, Argentina is unique in that it lies outside the tropical zone. They were looking for plants outside the comfort zone. They were looking for plants that in temperate areas that can do well. And a good example is my background, the Herianthus. So in this aspect, I think we are carrying the proud tradition of trying to push the boundaries and see what else beyond the usual tropical zone we can bring back to Singapore. Taking a leaf out of their predecessors' books, the team is seeking out new, interesting plants to test out back home. The flowers actually look like tiny sorts. Oh, so cute. Yeah. And they're looking beyond the beaten track. This is the Costanera Shore Nature Reserve. It lies over an abandoned infrastructure project. In the 80s, land was reclaimed from the nearby Silver River to build a new administrative centre. But these plans were buried by financial setbacks. When construction moved out, nature took over. They've set aside the space to develop a, a rich nature area next to the city. You see migratory birds coming. It must have a, quite a rich biodiversity in order for the migratory birds to come. Bay's Garden will have a similar vantage point for us to view the city skyline. We can think about how we can plan for some of the plants and biodiversity to grow a bit more naturally, greater integration between the urban spaces and nature. The team concludes their journey at Vivero Nursery in Lobos, a two-hour drive from Buenos Aires. Here, they place their orders for plants. These include trees with vibrant flowers and interesting bark textures. They mark their choices by tying tape around them. Then, they observe the nursery staff, who prepare the trees for the two-month-long sea journey to Singapore. Purchasing the trees is not like online shopping. That's the reason why we came down to Lobos Nursery. We also managed to see in person how they look and care for the trees to prepare them for the transport. That actually shows us how much effort or minute details they put into transporting the trees for us. Being there physically brought my arboriculture knowledge to another level. The next day, shipping contractors arrive to transport the trees to their new home. Bueno, para Para nosotros que nuestro lema es un, nuestro corazón en la tierra nos llena de felicidad y orgullo eh, que nos hayan elegido y, y que, nos, que nuestros árboles que han sido cultivados con mucho amor en nuestro vivero eh, sean trasladados a, al otro lado del mundo para nosotros para que sigan eh, embelleciendo ahí eh, algún jardín botánico algún parque y para también para que lo, lo disfruten otros este, Otras personas de otros países, in this case, Singapore. The trip to the four countries in Latin America was very exciting and rewarding. So it brought me back to the past where I understand how the seed exchanges and plant sourcing trip contributed to the greenery in Singapore. It allows me to treasure the mature trees planted by our forefathers, the precious green spaces which they have created for us. 60 years ago when our forefathers went to some of these places with the language and cultural barriers, we asked ourselves what motivates them to do so. They wanted a better Singapore, a better garden city which they can showcase. And so for me personally, bringing the younger horticulturalists to this trip and seeing the same love they have, I think I'm very gratified to note that the team did not flinch. Just as our forefathers who created space before us did not flinch. 60 years of greening, actually comes a long way and 
To see the Mempak tree at Faro Circles, we feel proud and inspired, especially when the younger generation is now all surrounded by greeneries. I believe Singaporeans today actually do see the Garden City, the Green Singapore, as part of our identity. And I do hope that it's something that can persist, that this greenery will continue to flourish and enrich our souls time and time again.